Grazie Presidente. Sono molto grato all'Istituto Universitario Europeo e al suo Presidente Borrell per questo invito in una sala, in un momento e in un'occasione così importanti. Questa è la mia prima visita a Firenze nella posizione che attualmente occupo e sono veramente lieto di portare in questa veste il mio saluto al Sindaco di Firenze Matteo Renzi e al Presidente della Regione Toscana Enrico Rossi, così come a tutta la città e a tutta la Regione. We are invited to discuss the State of the Union. I think it is necessary for us Europeans to combine candid pride and genuine concern. I think there is room for both, indeed, and I don't think one should find a mediation between these two attitudes, but on the contrary, one should be almost brutal in identifying weaknesses, but then rather full of hope in addressing them based on the pride that is justified because of what the European Union has achieved over uh, 60 years or so. This very simple combination of attitudes uh, will uh, guide my remarks. Uh, the, and, and I will devote uh, a bit of time to the issue of the day, of the decade, and of the century, growth, and then I will add some more uh, political remarks on the development of Europe. I believe that uh, growth in general and growth in Europe at this stage should uh, uh, be dealt with uh, dealing, uh, um, considering with an open mind three components or three chapters. One is the precondition for sustainable growth with particular emphasis on fiscal discipline. The second chapter is structural reforms, both at the EU level and at the domestic level for each member state. And then there is the third chapter, which is uh, the most uh, debated these days, the demand stimulus. Should one seek to have a demand stimulus? Should one uh, seek not to have it? What position should we take on this? Of course, this is a debate that is not confined to Europe. This is a debate that among European leaders and governments uh, uh, will be quite intensive in the next few days following the uh, election of the new French president and a broader set of electoral results in several countries. Uh, but I'm sure that we are going to have much of the same debate at the end of next week at the G8 in uh, Camp David. And uh, to oversimplify, without doing justice to any of the positions I describe, there is uh, a view which can be more characterized as being uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, which uh, relies rather heavily on uh, the role of aggregate demand. Maybe also because in the Anglo-Saxon economies on both sides of the Atlantic, structural issues are a bit over because those are economies with a high degree of flexibility. And then there is a more continental view, uh, particularly in Germany, which is an important component of the European continent, uh, which has a slightly different conception of uh, economics, in my view. Economics uh, is still, after all, 
a branch of moral philosophy, and growth is the reward for merit and for good behavior at the micro level as well as at the macro level. So any creative, imaginative, thought-provoking theory and policy which uh, may lead to more growth through some subversion of this uh, moral economic identity um, has at the very least uh, to be well explained in order to gain German minds and even more difficult German hearts. And I'm not speaking of German pockets. Uh, what is Italy's, what is my government's position in this debate at this moment? It's very easy to be articulated. Our government is fully convinced about the virtues of budgetary discipline. Fully convinced in operational uh, terms, so much that uh, we have a, uh, an objective which has been uh, agreed with the European Union of achieving the balanced budget already next year, 2013, which is uh, uh, quite a bit before most of the other EU member states. But we are convinced also intellectually, in, I believe in the country at large, uh, certainly in the current government because uh, uh, it's not just that uh, the European institutions want each member state to stick to treaties that each member state has subscribed, and it's not just that uh, a country like Germany, which holds uh, good cards in the overall games, insists very much on this, but it's also because if our memory is not too short, it is precisely the national experience of Italy, of France, of Spain, of Greece, and of other countries, even more north, that tells us that uh, if there is a systematic uh, um, way of buying uh, popular consensus and social consensus through expenditures which exceeds revenues, then those who ultimately pay the bill are the poor future generations. The problem is that it is nice to talk about future generations, but unfortunately they do come, they do materialize. And now uh, the, the current, at that time, future generations of Italian and of other, many other countries are indeed paying the price of the behavior of governments many, many, many years and decades ago, uh, which thought they were doing something morally very honorable by saying yes to everybody, but in fact depriving the current young generation of the possibility to find a job. So I have nothing against budgetary discipline. I think it's good to have budgetary discipline. Italians here will never have heard me tell my fellow citizens we have to comply with these requirements because the Commission or the Central Bank or Germany wants us to do so. So we are very committed to budgetary, uh, to budgetary discipline. But we are, we are also intellectually convinced and very committed on structural reforms, which need to be at the EU level, and then, of course, at the national level. And, uh, of course, previous governments did already quite a lot in terms of structural reforms. We believed and believe, and uh, the markets believe, and the European Union believes that Italy has to deliver more as, as uh, uh, Luca Cordero di Montezemolo underlined on structural reforms, and our government uh, has uh, 
spent few days without introducing some structural reforms. And we hope now to uh, bring home, after parliamentary approval, the labor market reform, which will come uh, in a row after the pension reform, after the uh, liberalization and competition reform, and so on. Uh, so we are in line very much with uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries in Europe with the UK in particular, in believing that structural reforms are very important for growth, structural reforms domestically, as well as the structural reform at the EU level, which is the one of which Michel Barnier is in charge, and of which he spoke so eloquently, that is building a real, genuine single market. Uh, and then there is the question mark about demand stimulus, the third component. Well, uh, I will briefly focus on uh, those aspects which are under the exclusive competence of the European Union or are under shared competences of the European Union and of member states. And I will therefore speak briefly about the single market, the major structural reform to come at the European uh, level and uh, the issues about uh, whether demand stimulus is in contradiction with uh, uh, budgetary rigor. Well, Michel Barnier had a very uh, precise and very telling sentence when he said, le marché unique peut être la première victime de la crise, mais il peut aussi être la voie de, de sortie de la crise, si j'ai bien noté. That's exactly what I think. And that, that's exactly why Italy, uh, I can say, well beyond its historic tradition, is putting a lot of emphasis in Brussels on the, uh, uh, the single market becoming a key for growth. Two years ago, this very day, and at that time it was the even more solemn 60th anniversary of the Schumann Declaration, I handed over to President Barroso, who had commissioned it, a report that was kindly mentioned by uh, Commissioner Barnier this morning on the single market. Two years ago, it was already very easy to foresee an integration fatigue, especially because it was there before the crisis already, before the financial crisis beginning in 2007, 2008, and was of course magnified, this integration fatigue, by the crisis, which induced many people to even rediscuss critically whether the market economy is altogether a good idea. And if you have an integration fatigue, which hits the single, in single market. And on top of that, a few years later, you have a market fatigue, which hits the market in single market. Well, it takes a very uh, brave commissioner, especially if he is French, as Michel Barnier, to, uh, to lead a fight uh, for more, not less, single market. That's why I admire and encourage his work. Uh, especially, it was possible to see at that time, but also a few years earlier, in many of our countries, west and east of the former Iron Curtain, the development of uh, parties, movements, that were essentially uh, opposing integration right extremes, left extremes, but basically united by the rejection of integration, be it at the European level, European integration, or at the global level, la mondialisation. Pronounced in French, it's even more worrisome than globalization. So, um, the, uh, it, it was therefore clear to me that 
at a time when the single market needed completion and needed concreteness, because as uh, Mr. Montezemolo underlined in the services area in particular, there isn't much of a real single market. Uh, it's, it's a hard job to promote more single market at a moment when there are, uh, there are uh, tendencies to, to go back to national preferences, to local preferences, um, not to speak of contrade, because that is an even more local notion, but is more cultural than a trade uh, notion. Uh, I, uh, in that report, promoted the idea, uh, which I unfortunately consider still valid today, that Europe, and this is political, not uh, technical, if I may trespass uh, a very delicate border, uh, the, uh, uh, Europe needs a new compromise between the more liberal countries, liberal in the sense of market orientation, like uh, the UK, Ireland, uh, the Scandinavians, but also the new member states like Poland and others, which have a great affection and enthusiasm for openness and competition and market, and the more socially motivated, large, normally, continental member states, like Germany, France, to some extent, Italy. Uh, in the past, uh, there was this compromise, and European integration progressed. But today, it is already at the level of, of the conscience and the feeling of individuals that, as many uh, roundtable participants underlined, there is a rejection and the turbulence. And I think if we want to re-engage broad public opinion on European integration, we must uh, see to it that the single market and integration more generally can be developed further, but without having the consequence, actually, or without creating the impression, even, that integration is against uh, social values, is against the right of workers, is against the environment. Otherwise, when these values come up, particularly after the crisis, uh, market integration will be stopped and there will be a reversal. Why do I mention all this in the context of growth? Because uh, having a fully fledged single market in Europe, which is a supply side measure, uh, is of course uh, a, a huge uh, potential source of uh, growth. Um, this is why when uh, it happened that I was given a government responsibility. Uh, we brought in, in my government this orientation also to the table of the European Council. And in view of the European Council of the 1st of March, uh, we uh, promoted these ideas about the, the, the single market as a factor for growth. Uh, writing a letter to Presidents uh, uh, Van Rompuy and Barroso, uh, which was co-signed by the UK government, an odd couple, after all, under conventional terms, and uh, by, uh, in the end, uh, 10 other heads of governments, but not by Germany and France, although Italy had re-entered a, a full dialogue with Germany and France after a a brief parenthesis. Um, now, I understand that following also the impulsion of that letter, the European Commission and, uh, and the Presidency of the Council are working to put on the table of the next uh, big European Council, the one in June, not the uh, more informal exercise uh, with the participation of President Hollande, which has been convened for the 23rd of May, will we'll put uh, uh, proposals and concrete actions that I hope and I understand go very much in the direction. For example, again, uh, I think it was Mr. Montezemolo, uh, maybe others, 
uh, dismissed rightly a bit the Lisbon strategy because it had no teeth. But why did it not have teeth? Because when uh, in the midterm review in 2004 of the Lisbon strategy, the Commission had proposed that individual member states should be named and shamed if they were not making progress on delivering the structural reforms prescribed by Lisbon, a couple of heads of governments said, no, 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 the Commission cannot embarrass us. So that weapon was dropped. Now this time, I have promoted around the table of uh, the uh, European Council a coalition of the willing, maybe of the slightly unaware willing, uh, because we will all be embarrassed, embarrassed in turn when the Commission will castigate uh, our countries. But it is only through that that we will be pressed by our public opinions and will press our ministers, our administrations to do the, the homework. Okay. Um, the, uh, and, and I also hope that following that letter, uh, the Commission will come up uh, with concrete proposals to make the enforcement of the single market rules uh, swifter, uh, more sure, quicker. It's not, uh, it makes no sense to refine and refine and refine every two years the, uh, the apparatus for budgetary discipline and its enforcement, which is very important, but then to leave the enforcement of the economic union of the single market very, very weak. And a country which wants not to recognize a diploma of citizens of another country in spite of the rules can drag on for four or five years before ultimately the European Court of Justice orders it to do so. This is inadmissible. This denotes a vision of European integration which has been tilted uh, in favor only of the fiscal aspects. Now, um, as to the last point, the demand stimulus, I think uh, for each idea we should uh, uh, not react uh, uh, on the basis of uh, automatic reflexes, but to consider uh, in a cool way, in a cold way, whether or not there is a departure from orthodoxy, uh, for, from the orthodoxy of budgetary rigor. Uh, and I will briefly mention two points that the Italian government is developing these days with our key partners in Europe and with the European institutions, which in my view provide room for growth in a non-inflationary way, fully consistent with the rigor of the Maastricht Treaty, the Stability Pact, and the Fiscal Compact. Uh, number one, a very old topic, which has always been dismissed. This is a topic that I had proposed at the table of the European Commission in 1996, when the uh, original Stability Pact was uh, constructed, but I was in a minority. If a country has a very high debt to GDP ratio, say 120%, and there are a few countries which do. Is that the only thing with matter, which matters, or maybe it matters also what has been done by governments over time uh, in using that huge sum of money that has been borrowed by them? Well, I would be much happier if I lived in a country which had a 120% debt to GDP ratio, if all that debt had been transformed into infrastructures, into uh, top class uh, um, 
uh, infrastructure of, of all sorts, uh, you understand me, from classical infrastructures to, to broadband, uh, et cetera, et cetera, rather than if it has been mostly dispersed in public current consumption. But the uh, stability, uh, fiscal contact, etc., don't really give other than a minimal importance to these distinctions between car spending and investment spending. And uh, uh, I believe that work can be done on this. Of course, it's delicate. Of course, we cannot jump to a, an adventurous position, say, anything that any government classifies as public investment should be exempted or looked at favorably under European rules. No, because it's, uh, it's uh, all too frequent in the past that governments have covered uh, losses of, for example, of public participated companies and then have accounted that as investment. So there, there have to be very strict criteria agreed at the European level uh, which distinguish between admissible public investment from these purposes and non-admissible public investment. And uh, I think that the objection, it's difficult to distinguish, it's difficult to implement and to enforce, is a very important second order consideration. The first order consideration is, are we prepared really to say that public consumption and public investment have the same economic value? No. If I uh, uh, am interested, uh, as Germans are, to the supply side, to the uh, to accumulation of productive uh, uh, capital, then, of course, public investment is more worth than, uh, than uh, um, public consumption or private consumption, although private consumption, even if it is through mortgages and indebtedness, does not meet any limit. And we have seen in Spain and Ireland the consequences, by, by the way. The other fruitful, I believe, point, so I think, and I will insist, that uh, the Commission, uh, at the very least, uh, puts on the table the beginning of a discussion on this point, as it did uh, with good merit uh, last year with uh, the green paper on the euro bonds that were unacceptable to several member states at the beginning, but discussions take away emotional aspects. And I am sure that they will come uh, um, sooner rather than later. The other point is the treatment of arrear payments. If public administrations are indebted vis-a-vis uh, -vis companies, uh, uh, that indebtedness is perfectly known. Simply, it's not accounted for in the uh, fiscal uh, rules, under the fiscal rules. So it would not be the immersion, Greek style three years ago, of uh, a uh, hidden debt. It would be the explicit treatment of a debt which is known, but if we are interested in, in the supply side, does it make sense that uh, governments distract, distract existing uh, supply capacity normally at small firms, productive firms, which are caught by a crisis of liquidity be because governments don't pay? So, before the fiscal compact goes uh, into effect, as I hope it will, after general ratification, it would make eminent sense to have a transparency operation, not uh, a tortuous uh, bypassing of the, of the rules, that would provide uh, oxygen to companies and will make accounting and budgetary more rig uh, and budgetary policy more uh, rigorous uh, in during the life of the fiscal com compact afterwards but i round off uh, in a couple of minutes because i've spent uh, too much time on growth uh, on uh, the, the more political aspect uh, 
I think uh, I say nothing, nothing new uh, if I say that the issue of the moment is not only growth, but is the question, is integration reconcilable with democracy? The apparent answer in many countries these days is no. I am convinced that it is reconcilable with democracy, that an important role has to be played and can be played and is being played more than people recognized by the European Parliament. The European Union is the only international body, so to say, which has a fully-fledged democratic legitimacy based on direct elections. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think the biggest mistake in dealing with uh, uh, the crisis, the political crisis of the European Union would be to believe that the root of the problem is at the level of the EU. I have spent 10 years in a European institution, the Commission, and I've, I've spent uh, now almost six much, much longer months, as I can assure you, in a national government. It's interesting to compare experiences. But uh, if one steps back, I think the, uh, the crisis of politics in Europe, I would put it this way, is first and foremost at the national level, where the combination of uh, media increasing short-termism of uh, the public opinion uh, lead politicians in many countries, and I say this with profound respect, to be less and less leaders and more and more followers, uh, uh, shying away from unpopular solutions that would bring benefits in the longer term. And that's not a bad idea that in Europe we have the European Union reminding us of the policy criteria. So in most democratic countries in Europe, but also in the US, I mean, they, they, don't have, they don't have 27 member states, and the president of the US is a, is a very powerful, powerful figure, but he has Congress. I'm not sure that Congress is easier than 27 uh, member states. Um, so, uh, and he is unable to deliver on many things that he wants and he thinks he should deliver to the G8, for example. So I think, uh, um, and, and I, I am convinced that Italy in this juncture can provide a, a good contribution, both to the debate on the future of the European Union as a manifesto published today of, of the Italian federalist movement does, as well as the uh, always uh, vigilant and enthusiastic uh, monitoring on European integration done by our president, Giorgio Napolitano. And Italy, uh, after all, not only had uh, Alcide de Gasperi and Altiero Spinelli, but Italy was at the presidency of the European Union in three critical occasions when it was decided to go for the direct elections of the European Parliament when 1985 European Council of Milan, it was decided to go ahead for the single act and the single market. And in the Rome Council of 1990, when it was decided to overcome the resistances of Margaret Thatcher, and it was decided to go ahead towards the Maastricht Treaty. And Italy is uh, the only country where the Lisbon Treaty, also thanks to the influence of President Napolitano, has been ratified by two, by both houses of parliaments with unanimity, not an abstention, not a vote against. And uh, I, I agree that uh, uh, faith in Europe should not be a religious matter. We need debate, but I'm confident that there has been a strong continuity 
uh, among the various um, Italian governments since a long time, uh, the various uh, Prodi governments, Berlusconi governments and others. And uh, I hope that uh, along this tradition and with uh, a renewed, I hope, credibility about uh, the willingness of the Italian people to stick to um, uh, disciplined uh, economic behavior domestically, Italy might provide a helpful role in allowing uh, the European Council and the whole of the European Union to find uh, quickly a sustainable and sound uh, way to growth. Thank you very much for your attention. Eh? È andato via, ha deciso che è troppo tardi.